Thank you so much for coming to this amazing event. Uh, my name is Haima Marlier. I co-chair our securities litigation enforcement and white collar practice, and I co-lead our fintech practice. Um, and we're so happy to have you all here. Before I joined MoFo, I spent uh, almost a decade in the SEC Division of Enforcement, which was just a wonderful, wonderful place to work. Um, we're joined not only by folks in this room, but uh, also folks on Zoom. Before I introduce our guests, I would like to thank our partner, the South Asian Bar Association of New York, and a special thanks to my friend, Ashish Bud, who really helped to pull this um, all together. I'd also like to thank MoFo's business development team and our staff here for just putting on a great cocktail reception with um, drinks and food. Um, and now on to our podcast stars. Um, soon you will hear from Simi Shah. She's an MBA candidate at the Wharton School of Business and she is the founder of South Asian Trailblazers podcast. She has interviewed just a truly impressive roster of people from our community artists, politicians, business people, um, and of course tonight people from our legal community. Um, you can find South Asian Trailblazers on, I found it today on Apple Podcasts. You can find, you know, so check it out um, and please do see who she's talked to. And Simi's guest on, our pod, on the podcast today needs no introduction. Uh, Gurbir Graywall is the director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. Gurbir, we met for the first time today, but I heard you, I've heard you speak a number of times, and the last time was at the Securities Regulation Institute Conference on Coronado Island okay. in January, and I loved how you started your remarks. So this is what Gurbir did. He starts, he's asked some sort of substantive question, and then he says, who here is from New Jersey? And there's like a <laughs> small smattering of hands, most of them South Asian people, and then he's like, who here wishes they were from New Jersey? <laughs> and I have to say, as a South Asian New Jersey mom with my kids in the Essex County Public Schools, yeah. you just warm my heart. Um, so although much maligned in certain circles, the Garden State is a truly special <laughs> city, a truly special place for our community. So just stand strong and uh, keep, keep promoting it. Um, and we're really excited to hear about your journey today from Jersey and uh, to beyond. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ashish. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, you know, why don't we give a, another round of applause to Morrison Forrester for their generosity and hosting. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ashish. I'm president-elect of the South Asian Bar Association of New York. Our current president, Hannah Bora, is out ill. She sends her regrets, but um, you know, we're so happy to be hosting this event. Um, for those of you who are not so familiar with what a bar association is, because I know that there are a lot of folks in this room who are not lawyers, um, I want to tell you a little about the South Asian Bar Association of New York. You know, our focus is really to uh, support the career development of South Asian legal professionals in the New York metropolitan area. And, you know, we do that through you know, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Uh, we do that through top-down mentorship. We do that through fellowship grants for you know students who are pursuing careers in the public interest. Uh, we do that through networking, all of that. And I think one of our most important roles as an organization is to be the voice of South Asian legal professionals in our community. So whenever somebody is up for a judge, for example. Uh, we might often be the closest association who can offer them an endorsement. So we'll review their qualifications, talk to their references, talk to them, uh, you know, and, and really emphasize to the mayor's office or to a senator that they're qualified. We are often a go-to point for South Asian-focused nonprofit partners who may need support with legal matters that relate to uh, domestic violence issues, uh, housing concerns, all sorts of really important stuff. I think that the law really touches on virtually every industry uh, in some way. And so that is one of the reasons why I'm so proud to be partnering with South Asian Trailblazers today. Because that's what South Asian Trailblazers is about. It's really elevating South Asian professionals. We're doing all sorts of really amazing things. And because our missions dovetail so well, when I met Simi about a year ago, 
I was just so um, enthralled with the idea of partnering with her in some way. Uh, and as I've worked with her on putting this event together, or you know, we, we've had plenty of misses and impossible event ideas, uh, as I've talked with her and learned how she works, I can just tell how much thought she puts into everything that she does. Every single part of this event is all her. Uh, I think that she really has an eye for detail in, in you know, were she to do something in the client service arena, like many of us lawyers do, she would, she would absolutely kill it. Um, and so, with that said, uh, I thought a, a great kind of nexus point for South Asian Trailblazers and Savani would be to bring Simi into a room with longtime Savani friend Gravir Graywall, or Director Graywall as he's known on the streets. Um, you know, no one's street, so, <laughs> so Drabir, uh, you know, he's he's been a long time Savani member. Uh, many of his old friends are in the audience today, and he's you know, despite his his prominence and and the level of success that he's attained in his career, he's always been well regarded as somebody who's just so humble and always willing to sit down and chat with uh, members of our community. So. So thrilled to have you, Grabeer. Thank you for doing this. Uh, you've heard enough from me, but if you want to chat about the South Asian Bar Association later, I'll be around after this. So without further ado, I'll just turn it over to Grabeer and say Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, as Ashish said, I'm Simi Shah. I am the founder of South Asian Trailblazers, and we are a media platform, community, and more recently, a talent agency dedicated to elevating leading South Asians. Um, and I know you've heard it multiple times over now, but I really want to say a profound thanks to Haima and Ashish for making tonight a reality. Um, it's so special that at this stage in our lives, we have the opportunity to create spaces like these where we can convene South Asian professionals, not just from law, but varied spheres of influence. Um, and it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, some of you have heard of our eponymous podcast, which is called South Asian Trailblazers. And we are really dedicated to diving deep into the journeys of trailblazing South Asians and cutting beneath the surface to, beneath the surface to learn how they charted their journeys in a way that can inspire our own. And what, what a better way to do that than with a trailblazer like none other, who, as Haima said, needs no introduction, Gravier Graywall. You've heard about him in the streets, but I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about his formal introduction, because it's pretty incredible. The streets are talking. <laughs> Gravier is the director of the Division Enforcement at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Before joining the commission in 2021, he served as the Attorney General for the state of New Jersey, becoming the first ever sick and second ever South Asian American to serve as state Attorney General in American history. Prior to this role, Gravier held the role of Bergen County Prosecutor, the chief law enforcement officer for New Jersey's most populous county, and as we now know, everyone's favorite state. <laughs> In this capacity, he concentrated on fighting the opioid epidemic and white collar crime. Earlier in his career, Gravier served as an assistant United States attorney for the District of New Jersey, where he was the chief of the economics crimes unit. He also spent time as an assistant United States attorney for the Eastern District of New York, where he was assigned to the Business and Securities Fraud Unit. He began his career in private practice at Howry LLP, and he holds a JD from the College of William and Mary and a BS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University. Gravier, thank you so much for being here today. Well, th thank you, Simi, for having me, and uh, thank you to Sabani and, and uh, our host this evening. It's, I'm just thrilled to be here, and I'm actually very humbled to be here uh, that so many people came out uh, to hear me speak. When I walked out of the elevator, I didn't see anybody in this room, and I had an oh crap moment, <laughs> like no one's coming. Uh, so it's nice to know that you're all in the other room uh, and you're all here this evening. So thanks for being here. I'm kind of glad we gave you a little bit of a scare. It keeps, it keeps you on your toes. It, 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 was, a, it was a big, big scare, yeah. <laughs> 
So as, as has now been mentioned a couple of times, you grew up in New Jersey uh, as a first generation sick American and child of immigrants. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and how it influenced your life's trajectory? Sure. Um, let me start by talking about another great New Jerseyan, Preet Bharara, um, who should not be a stranger to people in this room. Uh, I did a not a podcast, but I did a session with him on Monday uh, down at SIFMA, which is the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. It's a big deal for a lot of people who practice in this space. And uh, as we were walking uh, to the auditorium where the conversation was going to happen, I saw a couple conference attendees walk by and they were in their gym clothes and they were looking at the, the schedule for the day. And they said, you know, what, what's up next? And one woman looked to the others. Some guy Goober is speaking <laughs> with, with, and I said, it's Preet and Grabeer. And it really hit me in that moment because this is my sort of second podcast host interaction of the week, uh, that we've come a long way. Uh, that we've come a long way because Preet and I met here uh, at a South Asian Bar Association of New York event. Wow. That's how we got to know each other when we were both prosecutors. He was in the Southern District and I was in the Eastern District. And uh, it was pretty remarkable that I got to be on a stage with him where he was interviewing me in front of 3,000 or so financial professionals uh, talking about the work that all these people in the front row are doing uh, at the SEC as well as other colleagues of ours. So just wanted to share that because it's because of organizations like this one that Preet and I were able to, to assume the roles that we assume that I'm able to be in the position uh, that I'm in because organizations like this one supported us uh, and helped us uh, get where we are today. So, you know, the question was, what was it like growing up in New Jersey as a first generation sick American? Uh, I don't have to give the SEC disclaimer to give this answer. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 was, it was really hard. Um, it was very, very hard. It's very different uh, than how my daughters are growing up now. I'll give you one example. My, my youngest daughter, who's 11, uh, her best friend, Quincy, loves Indian food. Uh, they are over our house, uh, they're, you know, her, her other friends, and they're eating my mom's cooking whenever she's around and, and, and preparing food for the kids. And uh, her parents love Indian food. And I remember as a kid, I wanted it, the Indian food to go away. I didn't want to feel different. I didn't want to smell different. I didn't want our house to smell different. I didn't want you know anyone to know what it was like. Um, because I remember getting made fun of if I walked on the bus and I, my clothes smelled like Indian food because my jacket was like in, on the kitchen table or something like that. And I was embarrassed by it. And that's just one small example that you know we were so different and there were very few people who looked like us, who came from where we came from, who spoke like us, who had similar family backgrounds. And now it's just part of growing up. We live in such a diverse area, such a diverse part of the country uh, that it's not viewed upon as being that different. I remember elementary school. I remember being tormented uh, pretty much on a daily basis because of my appearance. Uh, I wore a patka, which was a head covering that, that young sick boys would wear. I had my hair uncut, and it was a real struggle. And, and you wonder why you go through this, why these traditions are so important. And, you know, you have family support, but you don't have community support. And I'm so lucky that my children now don't have to deal with that and have community support. Uh, they're, they're not made to feel like the other, that it's just normal now to be who you are. And uh, that wasn't the case then growing up, and it wasn't the case professionally uh, either, as we'll probably get into. Absolutely. It's interesting because it sounds like the shift, I think, for our community broadly has gone from just surviving to thriving. And I think organizations like ours between Savani and Trailblazers really exist to hopefully continue to push that mission forward. When you were young, you had early aspirations of being a novelist <laughs> and then more seriously of being a foreign service officer while you were at Georgetown. But fate got in the way when the State Department decided that they had maxed out their quota on foreign service officers. How did that sudden shift change the trajectory of your career and your path into law? I mean, there were a lot of shifts along the way. Uh, I think for many of us in this room, we probably shared this experience that our parents and our families really left everything and everyone that they knew to come to this country to lay down roots uh, for better economic opportunities and for better educational opportunities for themselves and for their children. 
And so when you're growing up, there's a lot of pressure on you to, to take advantage of those educational opportunities, to take advantage of those economic opportunities. And so, you know, I'm sure it was the same conversation in many households here that, you know, you need to grow up and to be a doctor, you need to grow up and to be, you know, a professional, uh, an engineer. Uh, and as a child uh, who loved loved reading fiction and loved Kurt Vonnegut, I thought I would be, you know, a writer. That's what I wanted to do, that I wanted to write the next great American novel. Uh, and that didn't really go over well with my parents. Um, they didn't really understand uh, anything about Vonnegut, and they didn't understand what it meant to be a writer and why I wanted to go down uh, this career path. But I, I chose the smallest school I could find and the most isolated place I could find, and that was in Maine. Uh, and I, I ended up going to Bates College. Um, and there were a number of problems with that decision. I had never been to Maine in the winter. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I wasn't a good writer. I, I couldn't write fiction. Uh, and so I did pivot. I did pivot. I had a roommate who was looking to transfer. Uh, and he had a Georgetown application for the Foreign Service School. I asked him if he was using it. He wasn't. And I applied to one school and one school only to transfer. And I said, because it would be really cool to travel the world and represent the United States and be a diplomat. And so I went to Georgetown, I pursued a foreign service degree, which was great. And, and like my failed writing career, uh, this too failed. Uh, because as I was graduating, the exam you have to take to join the foreign service, the foreign service exam, wasn't being offered because there was a hiring freeze at the State Department. So I had no plan B, uh, and I came back. Uh, to New Jersey, as many people may do, go back to your family home after you graduate college with no plans. Uh, and I was literally watching television, and I saw Law & Order Marathon. Uh, <laughs> and I thought to myself, like, this Jack McCoy guy, he, this is pretty cool. But, but, but not to be a prosecutor, but to be a lawyer, to be a litigator. Uh, and so I decided to apply to law school, and that was sort of just on a, on a whim. Um, wow. thinking that, you know, I'd done debate when I was in, in college, that I could, you know, be on my feet, argue cases, um, that these cases only take about 60 minutes or whatever, <laughs> you can take the vacation, <laughs> the commercials out rather. Uh, and I thought that would be great. And, and so I applied to law school and I ended up uh, going to William & Mary and um, getting my law degree there. Wow. Now, upon graduation, you transitioned to working in big law in D.C. at Howry LLP, which was focused on an antitrust, global litigation, and intellectual property law. Today, we have entire support structures like Sabani built for lawyers of color. But at the time, I imagine there were few. When you first started working in big law, did you feel like you had to fight for a seat at the table? I felt like I had to fight to get in the building. Wow. I mean, let alone a seat at the table. I remember... You know, I went through the summer associate program at Howry, and, you know, I was lucky enough to be interviewed on campus by an incredible uh, lawyer named Martin Cuniff, who we just hit it off. We actually had the same birthday, and I think that sort of resonated with him, and uh, we both had a shared love of Indian food, and much of our interview was around that. And so Martin took a chance on me. Uh, I ended up going to Howry. And, and as it happens, you know, the summer experience is not indicative of what the real experience is like. I don't know if anyone is still in law school. Uh, but, you know, I ended up at Howry. I walked in the door. I got assigned to a particular team to work on a matter. It was, a, it was an antitrust matter, and, and there had been a second request uh, from the government in this merger. Uh, and I was sent to a warehouse in Largo, Maryland. Uh, with with a whole team of people, a bunch of young associates, and we're, we're literally going through boxes and boxes of documents that other lawyers had pulled and sent to this warehouse for us to look at in these conference rooms. And, and, you know, back then, you had to find the hot documents, and you would get another piece of paper, and you would put it on, on that document, and you would code it by hand, and you would, like, photocopy it. It was just, it was nuts. And then you would have, like, a smaller pile of documents, and then you would just sort of categorize them. Uh, and then you would have senior associates and you'd present your findings if we saw something that was particularly troubling. And you'd learn a little bit more about the case, but you didn't really have a fuller understanding. And then pretty soon, I, I remember it was a, a merger among two bread companies, of all things. And, and you know, there were these meetings back at the main office in D.C. And a lot of the younger associates who were with me in this warehouse would be called to those meetings, but I, I would never be invited to those meetings when the client was in town and, and they were presenting to the general counsel. 
And it wasn't because I screwed anything up. I hadn't been there long enough to screw anything up. <laughs> it, it, it occurred to me it was because of my appearance and of what I looked like. And, and, and that's, that's hard to get your, your, your arms around and, and to really think about that, right? When you're just sort of these microaggressions and, and you're just left in this warehouse when the rest of your team is sitting you know, at a conference room and getting to interact with the client. And, and there were no support structures. There, there was no, you know, mentorship program. There were no other lawyers who looked like me there. There were no other lawyers who had the same skin tone as me there. And um, so, but for the fact that I, I was able to connect with a lawyer who I'd met during my summer associate time there, who I said, you know, I'm leaving. I, I don't think I could do this because this is not a good place to be for me mentally and also professionally. And he said, Kabir, give it a, a chance, give me a little bit of time, I'm gonna get you put on the case that I'm working on. And so somebody took a chance on me, somebody mentored me and got me on their team, uh, and that kept me there, and that got me onto a trial team, that got me into, into the courtrooms, uh, because this team didn't care who you were, what you looked like, what your background was, if you could do the work, uh, they would yell at you equally, right? They would just, it was just all about the work. It was, and some people couldn't survive these teams, but for me, it was just all about the work. And so because of that support structure and that informal mentorship, and there wasn't, you know, the, the South Asian Bar Associations, the, there were informal gatherings, right? The best we did wasn't like in a setting like this. It was a, at the back of some desi restaurant where you would just like at the back room. Like you remember this like early on. Um, but it was still a place that you could just go complain and, and get a little, you know, see somebody else who's doing a little bit better and get a little bit of encouragement and come back and, and, and survive, you know, the, the, the next uh, microaggression or macroaggression and, and, and sort of push through. How did those experiences impact the way you view yourself as a mentor and try to approach mentorship today? I just make myself available. I think p part of, you know, part of the responsibility that I have, uh, given the position that I have, is to make sure that I'm out there and making myself available to answer questions people might have because no one was there to support me or answer my questions. And, you know, uh, my, my, my secretary knows this and others know this. Like if I go to an event like this and I will say, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn if you have a question, if I could be helpful to you. And people do. And we set up time. And I apologize that I'll talk to Tasha on, on, on Monday uh, or tomorrow and we'll, we'll get it on the calendar. But, but I do make that time. And I think it's important to make that time because if I could answer a question, share some experiences, to make somebody else's career path a little bit easier for them to navigate, then that that's that's a huge accomplishment, uh, and it's part of the debt I have to pay forward. For what it's worth, I think I cold messaged you on LinkedIn, and you did respond, <laughs> <laughs> and here we yeah, are. Yeah. Um, now I want to shift gears a bit to the other chapters that your career that you embarked on in your career, the events of 9-11 have profoundly affected a lot of individuals and, and oftentimes many South Asians with respect to their careers. You've described it as one of the first times in your life that you were made to feel un-American. Can you talk a little bit about how you felt in the aftermath and how it motivated your career into public service? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think those of us who, who are of the age to remember 9-11 in this room, um, remember that morning and remember the details of that morning, remember where we were, remember what we were doing, remember what the weather was like. And, and I was in Washington, D.C. at the time, and I was driving to work, and our office was at 12th and E Street. And on the way to work, I started to hear you know, the, the news uh, of what was happening, uh, about these potential terrorist attacks, about the planes, about uh, about there, there being, you know, this this plane. I don't know if the first plane had hit at that point, but I, I remember it was, you know, this news was just breaking. So when I got to the law firm, I, we went to the attorney lounge with a bunch of other lawyers. It was on the 12th floor, and we were not too far from the White House, and you could see the, the Pentagon as well. And w we watched the towers fall together as a, as a group, all these lawyers in this room. Mm -hmm. And I remember experiencing that coming together we felt as a country at the time, the, you know, just this sense of like shared grief and, and outrage and, and, you know, this surge of patriotism. And, and 
for a lot of people, that lasted for a long time. For me, it was pretty short-lived because I remember leaving the office that afternoon. I remember speaking to my mother who had called me to tell me to be careful. And I, did, I couldn't really process that at the time that, you know, the country was under attack. Why do I, I need to be careful? And she said, because, you know, they're hearing things about other six who were in New York City or in the surrounding areas who were starting to be harassed, who were, you know, st- targeted on their way back out of the city because it was, it was just, it was mayhem here, right? The, the country had been attacked, thousands of people killed. And then immediately people look to target people who look different or who they thought looked like the people responsible uh, for that tragedy. And I didn't think anything of it. She said, you should go get some groceries and maybe stay home for a couple of days. And again, I, I just couldn't fathom why she would say something like that. I was American, like I'm, I'm angry too. And then I started to feel it. Going to work, whether I was driving in and people staring at me or honking at me on the highway, or on the metro, people whispering things, or not even whispering things, saying hateful things. Oh. I remember leaving the building a couple times with other lawyers and people, you know, yelling, "Oh, there's Bin Laden! I got him! I got him!" And and then I think it was probably before the first weekend that one of the first hate crime killings was of Bilbir Singh Sodhi, a Sikh in Mesa, Arizona, who was just planting flowers outside of his gas station that he owned, and. This guy, Frank Roque, shot him because he thought he looked like the people he was seeing on TV who were responsible in this guy's mind for this horrific tragedy. And so that, that killing and, and, and you know, seeing President Bush go on TV and to, to try to calm the, the uptick in hate that we were seeing by talking about the need to respect people who were Muslim and respect people of different faiths, it really got me thinking that why was this happening? Why was I made to feel so un-American in this moment? My mom was a soccer mom. I, I did all the things that you're supposed to do. I had a normal childhood. And I couldn't really come to any other answer that other than that we haven't done a, be- a good enough job, at least for, for, for the Sikh community, of telling people who we are. Not telling people who we aren't, but telling people who we are, that we too we might come from different backgrounds, different religions, but that we too are part and parcel of this thing called America. And so I thought about the ways in which I could do that. People were enlisting in the military because of that surge in patriotism. People were doing all sorts of things to become first responders in that moment. And I thought that I needed to get into public service at that time. And I thought given my background, given the fact that I was a lawyer, a litigator, that I wanted to be a prosecutor. I wanted to, to go get up in courtrooms and say that I represented the United States, that you could look like this, you could believe a different way and still be part of this thing we called America. And that's what I did in that moment and, and haven't looked back since. I mean, that was my trigger to public service. I never had it earlier than that, but that's what sort of set me on this journey and, and sort of keeps me on this journey that maybe through 12 jurors at a time, you could change people's perceptions. Uh, maybe through interactions with law enforcement agents as a prosecutor, you could change people's understanding. Maybe they interact differently the next time they see somebody who looks uh, different. Uh, maybe it's the courts. Maybe it's the people who are working in the courts. And maybe it's the public who sees you in these roles. And so that was, that was what motivated me uh, to get into public service. And that was my experience of being made to feel an American and trying to do everything I could to show people that, that – this is just as American as anybody else. Absolutely. That experience seemed to mark your first foray into public service, beginning with your time as an assistant United States attorney, first in Brooklyn and then in New Jersey. Can you talk about some of the memorable experiences you had making this transition and the cases that you worked on? Well, I remember the first time I I went to the the courtroom in Brooklyn (laughs) Uh, you shadow people around, and I don't know if Harold's here, but you, yeah, you you go around with somebody who's more experienced. You get to go sit in the different courtrooms or see how the uh, the general crimes assistants are doing their jobs. And so I was shadowing uh, an AUSA around, and I was just sort of behind him, uh, and somebody walked in and looked at me and said, like, oh, oh, you're the translator for the next appearance? Uh, and, and it was like, not even an Indian name, the next appearance. Uh, but that I remember that experience vividly, uh, and that just sort of reinforced the importance of, of, of doing what I was doing at the time. So, you know, I think 
as an AUSA I, in, in, in Brooklyn, um, you know, I had a, an opportunity to work on a lot of really important matters. Uh, I would think, I think they were all important in different ways. The, the most high profile matter there that I, I worked on was uh, a, a prosecution of about 16 supporters of, of the Tamil Tigers. At, 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 it was a material support case where people were fundraising here to support uh, an organization that had been designated as a terrorist organization at the time. Uh, and it was a you know, super interesting investigation to be thrown on as a young person or as a young, uh, a young prosecutor. But I also did a lot of uh, securities fraud investigations in parallel with some of my current colleagues at the U.S. Attorney's Office, a lot of uh, the microcap fraud cases in, back in the day, uh, some really great agents uh, in, in the Eastern District. Uh, in New Jersey, um, you know, again, a lot of financial crimes investigations and prosecutions. Uh, I investigated, um, sp spent a lot of my career in New Jersey investigating and prosecuting one person um, who committed a lot of different crimes, uh, a, a gentleman named Eliyahu Weinstein, who, who was responsible for what was at the time one of the largest Ponzi schemes in New Jersey. And despite my best arguments, the judge granted him pretrial release and he committed another fraud while he was on release, so we prosecuted him for that. Um, and then it was the longest white collar sentence in the history of the district. Wow. But then uh, his sentence was commuted by the last president and he was out for a brief period of time. And then my former colleagues in New Jersey indicted him again for a fraud that he committed um, after a sentence was commuted. Uh, and, in, and my colleagues here at the uh, commission also brought charges. Um, so he, he was like, I don't, I don't know if he was my Moby Dick or uh, <laughs> he was somebody who I spent a lot of my career with. Uh, certainly doesn't define my career. When I was a supervisor, I got to work on some really uh, super fascinating cases. Um, you know, when Sanjay was a supervisor here, uh, at, at the SEC in New York, the first hacking and trading cases that we did, the Newswire cases and others. And so uh, it was a range of experiences, all, all super rewarding. I want to spend a second talking about your experience navigating the political landscape, because I imagine it has been a source of frustration to some degree over the course of your career. In 2013, while you were with the U.S. Huh. Attorney's Office, yeah. You were first nominated for to serve as Bergen County Prosecutor by yeah. Governor Chris Christie, and then due to certain political impediments, your confirmation hearing was never scheduled. You were nominated. Just to clarify, not political impediments about me, but about a bridge. Bridgegate. About yes. a bridge in New bridge Jersey. Bridgegate. To be clear, <laughs> related to Christie. Yeah. You were nominated again in 2016, and then successfully confirmed. Yeah. I'm curious if you can speak to your experience navigating all the political jockeying that happens and how if you've ever had a moment where you felt like maybe I should just go back into private practice. <laughs> I've had a lot of moments. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, listen, one piece of advice is never um, tell, you, tell your current employer that you're leaving until you firmly have a job in hand. Uh, so I went to the US Attorney in 2013. And I said, hey, Paul. Uh, I am going to leave the U.S. Attorney's Office within two weeks to, to become the Bergen County Prosecutor on an acting basis, and then you know, my confirmation hearings are going to happen whenever they were scheduled for. Uh, and then I had to quickly go back to him to say, I'm not just leaving quite yet. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, he didn't hold it against me, and he ended up promoting me to the Deputy Chief and then the Chief of the Unit um, during that sort of inter interim period. And, and it wasn't until... 2016 that I finally got into office. Um, listen, I, I think I, I have a lot of frustrations with the political process, but I also accept that when this jockeying happens, it's not about you. Uh, it, it's really about other issues that different people, you know, have with each other. Um, you know, when we get called up to uh, testify in front of the Hill now, uh, we're just proxies for other fights. And, and that's frustrating for, for the public servants who do the work that we do, that, get, that they get dragged into it, and that their intentions are questioned when 99.9% you know, .9 of the people are just there to do the right thing in every particular case and, and are there to protect the public in the case of uh, both prosecutors and, and, and the, the staff at, at the commission. And, and that's it. And when that gets questioned, it's hard, but you just have to push through. Um, and luckily, uh, Paul Fishman let me stay on. He didn't, he didn't push me 
uh, out the door, and then ultimately the political process worked, and, and I got in, and you know, it's fine, but you, you really have to have some thick skin. Absolutely. In your role as Bergen County Prosecutor, you focused on a number of issues ranging from the opioid epidemic, police reform, immigration. Can you talk about some of your more memorable cases and what it was like dealing with such heavy issues, especially given how much they impact marginalized communities? Yeah, it's, um, there was a lot. I mean, I, I got into office in 2016 and it became apparent to me because, you know, you, you get the work phone and, and I went home and I immediately started getting alerts about uh, opioid overdoses in, in the county. Like I would get notified of every opioid overdose, every opioid overdose death, every Narcan administration uh, in the county. And, it, you know, I knew the stats, you know, more closely back then, but I know the tide has not completely turned. Uh, and so that was a real wake up call for me because the difference between when you're a federal prosecutor and when you're a local prosecutor is that as a local prosecutor, you really see the impact you're making directly in, your, in the communities in which you serve. It's sometimes a few steps removed when you're a federal prosecutor. And so as I went around the county, uh, I met with a lot of parents who had lost children to the epidemic. I went to uh, NA meetings to hear their stories uh, for people who were suffering from this disease of addiction. Uh, I went to high schools. Um, I started a program where every Friday, detectives from our office would go to a local ninth grade class to talk about the dangers of addiction and, and the pathways to addiction. And we went quite often with those who were suffering from addiction, people who were in recovery, who went with parents who had lost children. And, and that really became the top priority for me at, at that point. Um, how do we sort of break these cycles of, of opioid overdose, Narcan save, and prevent the next opioid death? And I thought about it for a while. My predecessor had, had taken this approach of shaming people who were suffering from addiction. He would, you know, a lot of the, the wealthy kids from Bergen County would just go right over the bridge into Passaic County, into Patterson, and, and buy their narcotics and come back. And so what he would do is set up uh, ALPR, license plate cameras, to see who were people who were doing quick trips. And then arrest those people with the drugs on the Bergen County side. And then, you know, every quarter, put all the faces of the people who were arrested on the front page of the Bergen record. And I thought that sort of shaming didn't help people want to seek out, you know, resources for recovery. Uh, and, and I thought about doing something different because we could do that all day. We could do that every day and still not put a dent in this problem. So I wasn't working on cases in particular, but the thing I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of is coming up with a different approach for those hundreds of people we would arrest in these sweeps. What we set, ended up doing was standing up a program called Operation Helping Hand and saying, hey, you know, we know you went in to buy narcotics. We're, you have narcotics on you. You have heroin on you. In fact, you were throwing it out the window as we were pulling you over. We're not here to arrest you. And this was like shocking, shocking to people. We want you to come back to, to the prosecutor's office and we're going to line you up with services. We have people who are going to, to get you into a program. If you need to go to detox, we'll help you with that. If you need other forms of assistance, we'll help you with that. The, the, these drugs, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll ignore that. We'll, we'll keep a record of it uh, and, and we'll give you a shot. And the people who are out there helping us in this program were people in recovery. And it started, you know, anecdotally to help. And, and we saw it change outcomes in a number of cases. And you know, did it change everything? No, but it was something different because the, the, the usual way of handling this wasn't working. And so that program, Operation Helping Hand, still exists. When I was attorney general, I was able to bring it to all 21 counties, which was, you know, super important to me. Uh, and I think it's, it's really one of the, the things I look back on and say, you know, we might not have stem the tide completely, but we changed the conversation from incarceration to looking for different ways of, of helping people uh, break these cycles. I imagine that dealing with issues like these on a regular basis requires a considerable amount of mental fortitude. And beyond even just your professional work, even in a personal capacity, we've spoken a little bit about your experiences being bullied and discriminated against earlier in your career, but even as recently as 2018, 
There were incidents where conservative radio hosts referred to you as a turban man. The Bergen County Sheriff was resigned after being recorded <laughs> saying derogatory, derogatory remarks yeah. about your identity. How have you developed the mindset to overcome these moments and persist forward? I listened to a podcast on stoicism. Uh, no, no. And South Asian trailblazers. <laughs> South Asian trailblazers. You know, the, the, uh, the turban man thing was, was early on in my time as attorney general. And you, you mentioned marginalized communities a moment ago. I, I took some steps that were really unpopular back then about making sure we were building trust with communities. And I felt that the rhetoric at the federal level when it came to immigration and was not helpful in, in, in encouraging people to come forward and trust law enforcement if they've been the victims of crimes or you know, if they were a domestic violence victim. We wanted, to come we wanted them to come forward and tell us what happened and not fear that they would end up in an ICE deportation facility. So I had issued something called the Immigration Trust Directive. You have a lot of executive authority as AG, and your, your directives are binding on 38,000 law enforcement in the state, and they have to abide by those policies. And, and so we did that. To, to really draw a distinction that, you know, we are, we are law enforcement. We are not here to do federal civil immigration work that you can come to us without those sort of fears. And so I had done uh, a lot of work in, along those lines, policies that these radio hosts didn't think highly of. Um, and so they were talking about me on the radio one morning, the Dennis and Judy show, and they said, you know, our attorney general, what's his name? And, and Judy says, oh, I don't know what his name is. Um, and then she's like, I'll call him Turban Man. Um, and then she did it in like a sing-song voice. And it's like, it was, it's the most popular radio station in New Jersey, um, which I guess means something. Um, and then Dennis said, yeah, until he loses that turban, I'm not going to learn his name. Wow. And so, you know, that's tough. I, I didn't listen to it in real time. It was somebody sent me a clip of it. But when somebody said, if you lose the most visible article of your faith, then you're worthy of remembering, then your, your, your name's worthy of mentioning on the radio, it was, it was, really, um, it was really hard to deal with. Uh, but the way in which I dealt with it is I set up a Twitter account. Uh, <laughs> and that's when Kabir Graywell NJ was set up. And I think it was my first tweet. I said, and, and the tweet was something to the effect um, that, you know, my name is Kabir Graywell. I'm a sick American. I'm the 61st Attorney General of New Jersey. And, and this morning I told my daughters to turn off the radio. And, and really a way of saying to block out the noise. Like we, we're, we're not gonna let this drag us down. We're gonna push through this. Uh, and the response was incredible. It was incredible that you, know, you had s state legislators, you had federal um, f federal elected officials and so many others coming forward online and you know I didn't think that much of it in the moment but you know again I, I was very new to the AG's office and to, to end up on like PBS NewsHour that night talking about this and talking about how it affects people that this type of hate when you normalize it on the radio could lead to consequences you know, harmful consequences for people that we need to push back against. And so it took that negative moment and really galvanized a lot of people to, to push back against that. And, and it started a positive conversation. And then we started to do more work in our division on civil rights, which I was, uh, which is part of the AG's office. You know, the AG's office in New Jersey is one of the most powerful AG's offices in the country. And it's not because I was the AG. It was because it's got 16 different uh, offices and divisions and 8,000 people and that executive authority. And so we, we started to think about how could we use all those levers to push back on, uh, on, on bias and, 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 and this sort of hateful conduct that we were seeing, because that was also on the rise at the time, still is in some instances. Um, so, you know, th that, that's how I dealt with it. I, I turned it into a teaching moment for the state, a teaching moment for my kids, uh, and um, you know, led to about eight or 9,000 followers on Twitter at the time. I don't tweet much anymore. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I do want to spend some time talking about your time in the AG's office. Mm -hmm. On January 16, 2018, <clears throat> you were sworn in as the Attorney General of the state of New Jersey, becoming the first Sikh American and second ever South Asian to hold the position of a, as Attorney General of a state. Did you, have you ever had a moment where you were like, oh my gosh, 
this is what 16 year old me would have dreamed of? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, not a, like 16 year old me would never have ever thought. Um, I mean, 16 year old me would not have even thought I would be a lawyer. Uh, 16 year old me would never have thought it would be possible for somebody like me to be uh, an elected, not, um, not elected, but a, a county prosecutor. Um, or even a federal prosecutor, for, for that matter. I mean, uh, I, I, one, one thing I do want to share with this audience, because um, I'm just reminded of it now, when we did those presentations for those ninth grade classes that we started to do uh, all around the county, we, we, we have 70 towns in, in Bergen County, uh, we have about a million people, and so we would make detectives go sometimes twice a day to make sure we covered every school. And I would try to go to as many of those as I could on those Fridays to speak in those schools. And it wasn't because I was the most knowledgeable on the issue. The reason I, I wanted to go to those schools and speak to those audiences is because I remember what it was like to sit in a school assembly. I remember what it was like to sit in the back of an assembly, you know, after somebody had some, said something terrible to me or, you know, I had suffered some sort of you know, indignity or, or some sort of, you know, slur, whatever the case may be. Like, I was not a confident kid. And I would slouch in, the, in my chair in the back of those assemblies and just, like, feel isolated uh, just because of the way, you know, I was treated at the time. And I said, maybe there's a kid like me in that audience. Like, obviously, we want to talk to kids about the perils of addiction and the dangers of these different pathways. But I also want to go there and stand next to these detectives, and I want to go stand there next to these professionals, and I want them to see me as the chief law enforcement officer in this county, and I want them to feel a little bit more confident about themselves, that maybe you know, seeing somebody like me prevents somebody from saying something to them. Maybe it gives them a little bit more confidence uh, to, to live their identity if they're, they're sick or you know, their religion uh, if they're feeling intimidated in any way. That's why I did it. And, and I heard from parents where, where it did have that impact. And so, so 16-year-old me didn't have that. And so didn't, couldn't imagine it. I'm glad that 16-year-olds from my same background, from our background, now get to see you know, people like me, get to see people like Preet, get to see people uh, in these positions, get to see Ravi Bala in, in, in New Jersey, who's the mayor of Hoboken. Um, that, that gives them more hope about doing things like this. But 16-year-old me could never have imagined it. Um, but I hope more 16-year-olds can imagine it now because we've had these opportunities. Absolutely. To that end, I want to shift to speaking a little bit about your role today. Yep. In May 2021, a top advisor to SEC Chairman Gary Gensler contacted you about an open role at the SEC. Is he was he here a moment ago. He just stepped <laughs> out. <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you were contacted about the role of director of enforcement at the SEC. How did that conversation go? What were you thinking? So top advisor to uh, then, or current chair, then top advisor to, to Chair Gensler is just walking into the room. She just said, <laughs> <laughs> um, how did that conversation go? So here, here's, here's just some career advice. I, I have never done anything uh, professionally looking for the next job. Uh, I've always tried to do the job I'm in and do that job to the best of my abilities. And I think for those of us who work in these positions, it becomes very transparent, those who are working towards the next job or the next position or looking to, to do things to get ahead. Um, I think that served me well. Like I, I, I wanted to be in AUSA. I was doing the work. I was keeping my head down. And I got a call from Chris Christie and, and somebody had given him my name saying, you know, here's somebody you could talk to about the Bergen County prosecutor. I was doing the prosecutor's job and I was making a difference with Operation Helping Hand. I was uh, developing relationships with marginalized communities. I was going into church basements and, and school auditoriums to build trust with, with, with the black community and, and you know, do, doing the hard work uh, of, re, of rebuilding trust rather. And somebody saw that and gave my name to then Governor-elect Murphy for the interview. I was doing this job, or the prior job, the AG's job, and you know I had the opportunity by doing the work that we were doing to, to have an interaction with Prashanth, who's here, who is then, um, then counsel to uh, Commissioner uh, Robert Jackson, 
And because of that interaction, because one of the other many bureaus that I had uh, when I was AG was the State Bureau of Securities. So we were the state securities regulators. And so because of the work, I think he remembered that interaction. And when this opening presented, uh, they reached out and, and, and he gauged my interest and uh, we had a conversation. Um, and, I, and I think it's because we met doing the work, right? And so like that's, it's worked for me. Uh, I don't think it always works, um, but th that's how I've approached these things. And um, it was at a time where I was three and a half years into the, the AG job. The re-election cycle was coming up. Uh, and it was, it was an opportunity to do something different. Uh, it was a different challenge. It was the opportunity to work with great professionals that I had worked with in the past. It was an opportunity to have a, a nationwide remit. Uh, it, we have uh, nearly 1,600 people across 12 offices. Uh, it was the opportunity to, to you know, lead an organization uh, that has a stellar reputation. And, uh, and it, was, it was a challenge because it, was, it, was, it has been, continues to be a very steep learning curve. So, so I jumped at it. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that's how that conversation went. And then there's a lot of, you know, speed dating on, on, on WebEx and meeting people and uh, having conversations. And, um, you know, it, I was offered the job and I think it was July 26th of 21, I took it. No, oh, sorry, yeah, 21. Now the typical- Coming up on three years. Now the typical pipeline for the director of enforcement is usually it, it's not Bergen County prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's typically yeah. a Wall Street attorney who's yeah. you know spent you know a number of years in private practice. So I imagine your hiring raised some eyebrows. Did you ever have any doubts yourself? And I'd love for you to also share how you feel like your unique background has served you in this role. Doubts, yes, all the time. I think I've had doubts uh, in every position. Uh, that I, I've held, and I think doubts are normal. They're not anything, uh, that, it's not a negative, right? So I, I've had, you know, I had doubts when I went to be a federal prosecutor and was offered that. I didn't know anything about the criminal statutes, federal criminal statutes. I, I read Title 18 when I was uh, on the cell up from DC before my interview trying to like, you know, digest all this. Uh, when, when, I, when I became the Bergen County prosecutor, I didn't know the state criminal code, 2C, uh, but I learned it. Um, when I came here, I had a very narrow uh, view into the work that, that the SEC did. Uh, when you're a federal prosecutor, I mean, so many uh, of our former colleagues go out and, and they say, you know, securities litigator on, on their firm website. And no offense to anybody at MOFA or any other firm, but you don't really know this space till you work at the SEC because it is such a, a broad remit and it's, you know, a mile wide and a mile deep. And so, yeah, of course I had doubts, but like I knew that I, I, I have the, the resiliency to do this work, that I have the determination to do this work, that, that I've learned different, um, you know, different rule sets before. Uh, and, and I think I've developed an understanding that I don't have to know anything or a confidence, like I'm not insecure. Like I, I don't know everything, but Sanjay knows just about everything. So it's about <laughs> it's about picking the right team and the right people and the, having the right people ar around you and, and you know asking questions and and you know being okay with it. Um, so I think leading people is transferable, messaging is transferable, um, dealing with crisis. <laughs> like, you know, I dealt with a lot of crises in New Jersey. So when something you know we've been dealing with something all day, like it it just doesn't phase me. Like we we just need. Sure, you could see it as a problem. I see it as an opportunity, right? So that, that's sort of the those mindsets. It's all transferable, and um, but the key is like the people in the front row and uh, over there who who are just excellent, excellent public servants, and you know you have to lean on them. Yeah. And so this is a time for a shameless plug. We want to leave with more resumes that we than we came with. Uh, I know that there's like a, an outflow of people from the SEC. Uh, so please don't accept any resumes from any of these people, but if you have resumes to give us, uh, by all means, uh, bring them forward. There you have it. Come yeah. here and get a job. <laughs> Under your leadership, the SEC has imposed harsher penalties, particularly for repeat offenders. And when you came into this role, you had spoken about your vision for the SEC. I'm curious how that's shifted over the last number of years, especially given that 
the, one of the direct impacts of those harsher penalties has been record-breaking years for the SEC. I think the fiscal year ended September 30th was $5 billion, and the only year better than that was the year prior. Mm -hmm. Could you share a little bit about that initial vision and what lies in the road ahead? I mean, I think um, the, the, the important message that we're trying to send is that the penalties that we recommend to the client have to be viewed as more than the cost of doing business, that they actually have to have the deterrent effect that penalties are supposed to have, not just with the individual violator, but the general deterrent, deterrence effect uh, that penalties are supposed to have. And, and what I saw, and this goes back to, I think it was probably one of our first Wells meetings, uh, when very skilled defense attorneys from firms like this come in and they say, Oh no! I mean, you can't. There's just no possible way you could, you know, recommend a fine of over a hundred thousand dollars here. Look at the past thirty, you know, actions of this type. They've all been a hundred thousand or less. And I said, maybe I'm new here, but that would suggest to me that those prior penalties are not having a deterrent effect. That if people are co continuing to commit these types of violations and the penalties are all in the same range, maybe we have to, you know, m maybe it's got to be more than a rounding error. For, for some of these entities. I'm not saying we're ratcheting up in a way that's untethered to anything. We look at the comparables. We look at, at the offense. We look at uh, the judicial opinions. We, we look at uh, the statutory tiers. We look at all the factors we're supposed to look at. And we also look at, you know, is this a recidivist? Is this somebody who has had a, a history of violations with us? And we fully understand that if you're a big bank, you're going to have a lot of touch points with, with us. And you're going, some of these violations are going to be minor violations. But, but even, even a history of minor violations is indicative of something. And so we have to take all of that into account. And so, yes, there was a deliberate recalibration in the last number of, of, of fiscal years to make sure that we were crafting penalties that did have a meaningful deterrent effect. And here's the other thing. We're having a conversation about the SEC's penalties. People are taking notice. People are, are, are debating this at conferences like I was the, like the one I was at on Monday. People are, are talking about this in the law firm bulletins and alerts. That's a good thing that we're having a conversation because that to me shows that the message is getting out there. And here's, here's the other part of this. We're not all about ratcheting up, right? Those two, we're not looking to break records every year. We're also about ratcheting down. So if these penalties have had the effect that it's encouraging people to self-report, it's encouraging people to remediate, it's encouraging people to, to, to cooperate with us, we've had, I think, more recommendation, uh, more uh, enforcement actions uh, over the last several years where there have been zero to, to very you know, low penalties that reflect that cooperation. So it's just, it's both sides of that equation, right? We're ratcheting up in the right cases and we're recognizing where, where the impact is, has, where people have heard the message and we've had the impact that we're trying to, uh, to, to have, we're recognizing that by you know, reduced to zero to other forms of um, springing penalties to make sure that uh, these firms have the ability to use the money to remediate the problems and, and we're saying we're not gonna collect a penalty if you fix it. So you know it's, it's both sides of it and I think it's having the desired effect. Absolutely. Beyond penalties. The other hot button topic of the era is AI. And mm. a couple days ago, you released a video talking about AI washing, mm -hmm. which is akin to greenwashing. I'm curious if you can speak to what you see as the impacts of AI going forward on your work and also other issues that we should keep top of mind, particularly in an election year. Uh, did you use AI to generate that question? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> but ChatGPT did check my work. <laughs> It's funny. So somebody reached out to me um, yesterday. They're like, hey, man, do you mind writing an op-ed as a former AG about the, the viability of the county line in New Jersey? I'm like, I've got no time to do that. I'm not sure I'd be allowed to do that. A minute later, they sent me a draft of one. And they're like, I just went to chat GPT. The work's done for you. You just got to proof it. Uh, and I looked at it, and it's pretty darn good, uh, <laughs> which is really scary. It's probably better than I could have written. Um, you know, it, it's an extremely powerful technology. It's a transformational technology. As the chair says, it's probably the most transformational uh, you know, technology that, that we will experience in our lifetimes. Um, huge power. Uh, but we do see a lot of risk here. And the risk that we're seeing, and again, we don't care 
if people want to use you know machine learning we don't care if they want to use uh, other other tools um, you know generative AI or whatever the case may be they want to use it to make uh, recommendations or portfolio optimization or if they want to use it to generate marketing materials we're agnostic on the technology but where we have an issue is if you are telling the investing public that you're using this technology or that you're incorporating it and in making investment recommendations and you in fact aren't that you're just trying to capitalize on this incredible buzz around AI, that's a problem. You have an obligation to be truthful with the investing public. And the two cases we brought on Monday against two SEC registered advisors were to underscore that point. I mean, both of these advisors were making misrepresentations about uh, the use and, and incorporation of AI in, into, the, into the offerings um, that they were making available to the public. So, so that, that is a major concern for us. Another concern for us is the use of this technology in, in fraud and, and manipulation, you know, using new technology to commit old crimes. And so that is something that we're focused on as well. We're also focused on conflicts of interest, right? The technology, if you're incorporating this technology, if you're saying, uh, if you're speaking truthfully to the public about how you're using this technology, is that technology favoring you over your clients? <laughs> How are you guarding against that? Because a as investment advisors, as broker dealers, you have some obligations uh, under whether you're, it's a fiduciary duty as an advisor or whether it's uh, you know, regulation best interests. Uh, as a broker dealer, you, you have these requirements to make sure you're putting your clients first and not your interests ahead of your clients. So how are you guarding against that? How are you protecting against the technology if it hallucinates? You know, there was a story a couple of weeks ago about Air Canada having some chatbot that was interfacing with people who were trying to get compensated for uh, missed flights or other sort of inconveniences. And the chatbot started just offering all sorts of rebates and uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, sort of compensation for these folks. And like Air Canada was trying to walk away from it. Like, you know, how are you, if you're in our space, how are you protecting against these hallucinations? How are you... Uh, you know, protecting against uh, the technology just going completely off the rails. So, th so that's a concern for us. And as the chairs talked about, when you have fewer and fewer players in this space and a couple of just big players controlling a lot of this and a lot of people using those tools and those data sets and you have these monocultures being created, you know, that could lead to potentially bad outcomes if things go sideways, so, you know, a, fini a financial crisis of sorts. So. You know, what are you doing to protect against that? And so it is, it, is a, um, it is a concern. It's a transformational technology, but we need to make sure that folks are incorporating the right guardrails to get around it. Uh, and I'll punt on your political question. <laughs> As I, we, I, don't, I don't have any advice for the next election cycle. <laughs> As we approach our audience Q&A portion of the evening, I want to shift gears a little bit and speak a bit more to the reflection that you've done on a personal level. I'm curious how you've balanced the personal and professional in your life and the ways in which your family, your wife, your daughters have and continue to inspire you in your work. I mean, I, I, I think we all struggle with fighting, finding that right balance between uh, work and family, and I don't think I've found it. Um, you know, I think sometimes it's hard with all the travel and, and all the work uh, obligations. Um, so that's a, that's a constant challenge. I think part of the way I've tried to find it is that when you do shut it down, you do shut it down. That you do, when you're focused on family, you're focused on family and you put away the phones. It's hard. Um, but if you have a little bit of time, you've got to really value that time. But you got to make that time. And, and that's, it's, it's a challenge and it'll continue to be a challenge in this role or any other role. But I'm able to do this work because, uh, you know, my, my, my parents wanted, to, wanted me to be a doctor and, or an engineer and I, I disappointed them, but I did end up marrying a doctor. Uh, and so she's able to support my public service habit and has supported it for the past 20 years. And so uh, it's because they are supportive um, that I'm able to do this work and, uh, you know, the AG work, this work, I mean, you, you do it in, in large part for others, but you also do it for the next generation to show them. I think when I was announced as AG, I, I 
said I took this role so my daughters knew that there were no limitations on their success, that they could do whatever they wanted to do, that it doesn't matter where you come from, what you look like, what your background is, what your gender is, who you love, that if you do the work, it'll get recognized and, and you could achieve whatever success you know, is, is, is in the cards for you. And so that's why I did that and that's why I continue to do what I do. I'm just gonna say that if you're the disappointment, the bar is very high for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, the, I was having lunch with somebody today and we were having this conversation and I said, it's super interesting, right? My parents, um, old school Indian parents, very stoic. They don't listen to the Stoicism podcast, but they're, you know, <laughs> they're they, they channel their inner Marcus Aurelius all the time. And, you know, I hear them talking to my kids, like telling them, oh, I saw dad's speech on, on YouTube. I'm like, they, they know how to use YouTube? Uh, and it was a really good speech. They will never say that to me. <laughs> and then I hear them in the other room, like, you know, because they live not too far from us. Oh, Berta, I love you so much. I'm like, where was that? <laughs> where was that when I was growing up, right? Uh, it's super interesting to see, like, you, I don't know if, if, if some of the folks in this room could relate, like, I'm like, what about me? I don't have to tell you, you should know that. <laughs> so why are you telling them? Um, so I, I forgot what the question was, but I just wanted to share that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, I yeah. do have a final question for you, but before that, I would like to turn it over to our audience in case they have any questions. Sure. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Absolutely loved um, every aspect. I wanted to, you mentioned that, you know, you've always taken your career as it comes, um, and you've never looked for the next job. So what advice would you give to all of the aspiring law students, lawyers, non-lawyers, who we're the generation who's always looking for what's the next thing that I can achieve in life. So what would be the advice that you would give to us? So, you know, as big of a, a community as this is, the legal community, it's really small. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you apply for a job or if you interview for a job, somebody somewhere is, is, is going to, you know, know, you know, know me or know you and, and they'll make a call and they'll say, hey, do you know this person? She used to work here. What do you think of her? So I, I would keep in mind that this is a super, super small space, as big as we think it is. And, and so the, the advice I shared in, in the Rutgers Law School commencement speech that I gave, uh, which you should look up online, uh, <laughs> uh, is that, listen, you know, when you're graduating from law school or when you're early in your legal careers, uh, you're, you're a blank canvas, right? Nothing has been written about you. People don't know anything about who you are. You know, you come in there based on your grades and other work experience. But when you walk in the door of that law firm, you know, it, it's almost like trial. You start writing your closing statement right away. Like, you know, you start, you're adding to it. But you, I mean, or like a blank canvas. Like, so treat everybody with respect. And what I mean by that is from the person who works at the security desk to the person, you know, who gets your mail to, to your legal secretary, to the paralegals, and you would think that this is basic advice, but so many people just trample on, on people. And when I see something like that, or when somebody's walking in the door or, or the way they treat others, it, it resonates with me. When you're in the job, be a good colleague. You know, be the type of person who will be there for your colleagues, will be there late, will help pick up pieces, uh, will put in the extra hours with somebody. And when you're doing the work, do it with credibility. So, so when people you know, look at something that you put in, they could trust it, that you've done the work, right? And so it's, it's those little, little things. And when you start, you know, sort of adding to that blank canvas, so when people do pick up the phone and, and, and say, hey, th this person used to work for you, but is looking for a job here, what do you think about that person? That it's something positive, right? That it's something uh, that, that'll help you uh, in, in your career. I, I, I do think, you know, I'm not oversimplifying it, but people lose sight of that. Um, they really do about how small the community is and how much opportunity you have as a young associate, uh, as, as, as a new lawyer to, to really shape that story because it's not been written yet fully. Anything else? 
Jorge, anything? Jorge Tenrero, the chief of our crypto asset and cyber unit. If you have any questions about if something is a security or not, he's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> uh, how much Bitcoin? Is, how much is Bitcoin going to be worth? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't answer that. <laughs> I think we might get in some trouble here. <laughs> Where's the Office of General Counsel when you need them? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, my understanding, you uh, worked with uh, Paul Graywall, another yeah. Graywall. At Howie, right? So, what is your relationship with him now uh, uh, that you hold on different sides of the aisle, but you guys started your career somewhat together? Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. you can explain who Paul Graywall yes. is. Yeah, uh, Paul Graywall is the chief legal officer of, of uh, a public company called Coinbase. Uh, <laughs> Paul's Paul's terrific, um, and we were at the same law firm uh, towards the end, though, right? So, so I think it was my probably during my second time at Howry after I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office where the firm he was at um, merged or was somehow acquired by Howry. Uh, and it was, you know, I came back and I said, why are there two gray walls in the, the <laughs> Outlook directory? This is weird. Um, and so, you know, we would occasionally get each other's emails. Uh, I met him through uh, Nasaba events. And so I've known him for for many years, and, and you know, we're on the other side of the V. That doesn't mean you know we have to be uncivil towards each other, right? And so I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Uh, he's done incredible things throughout his career, having been a trailblazer in his own right, uh, been a magistrate judge uh, in, in California, uh, was high up in the legal department at uh, Meta, and then now is doing what he's doing. And so you know, we, we happen to have a disagreement that's playing itself out in court, but that's that's the work we do. Um, so uh, I, I joked about this at the uh, Nasaba conference, maybe not the most recent one, maybe it was the one before it where I, I was a keynote speaker and, and he had given a, a fireside chat um, about crypto and, and other things. And I joked that maybe in a future year you could uh, have a debate, Graywall versus Graywall in the future of crypto. <laughs> uh, and then I think not too long after that we brought our litigation, um, <laughs> coincidentally, uh, <laughs> that timeline. Uh, but he's, he, he's amazing. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, he's, better, he's better at Twitter than I was. <laughs> yeah. In addition to both being alumni of Howry LLP, they are also both now veterans of South Asian Trailblazers. We've yeah. had Paul in the class. Oh, is that right? Yes. Oh, amazing. Anyone else? Uh, Ro Khanna is sponsoring a bill to stop uh, politicians that are in committees from trading uh, stocks in those companies? Thoughts on that? Uh, you know, it's it's not for me to and express an opinion on that. And I, I should probably give the disclaimer in, in reverse that, <laughs> that my views this evening have been my own and my uh, in my position as director and don't reflect the view of, views of the commissioners, uh, commissioner staff. Uh, I, I don't have anything publicly to share on that. Uh, I, I will say that we brought over 100 insider trading actions uh, over the last three years it, it's it the issue remains rampant uh, we have a, a big trial starting on monday uh, in an insider trading case called panawat which has gotten a lot of attention um, it's it's something uh, that baffles me that people continue to engage in these types of behaviors thinking that they won't be caught given the 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 types of surveillance that exists um, the market surveillance and the tools that we have uh, and it you know Maybe it's anecdotal, um, but Sanjay and I have often talked about taking a, a trip to India to speak at all the business schools there. Uh, uh, maybe go to IIT and say, listen, if you end up getting a job at a bank in the United States, like insider trading is really bad. Um, it really is. Uh, we've seen a lot of you know South Asian professionals um, who, who come from some of the most prestigious institutions in India um, engage in this conduct. And I don't know. I don't know if it's something that's not viewed in the same way uh, in India and, and, you know, information asymmetries are to be profited off of, maybe culturally there. I don't know. It, it's an interesting uh, conversation to have, um, but we do see a lot of South Asian professionals uh, in this space. Maybe one more On both question. sides of the V. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned something interesting about AI and machine learning. I work in that space. 
So I wanted to find out from a litigation perspective, is that how do you determine, like when you have a chatbot or you have a recommendation system that is based on a data lake of data which is publicly available mm -hmm. and it's building recommendations on that, how do you determine that uh, this recommendation is not like in the public interest and could lead to like, like you mentioned with the Air Canada thing, yeah. it could have been like the chatbot is self-learning and it might have spit that answer, which is not on the engineer's part, but it could be like the way, it, so how do you how do you determine that, okay, this is something that's legally can be like, you know. I mean, I think you're, you're, you're putting your finger on some of the challenges. How do you, we, we have to, for many of the violations that we could bring um, or recommend to the commission to bring, uh, you have to have a certain intent, right? You, you have to have either you know, scienter or a certain state of mind. And, and if it's the, the, the engineer created a tool and the tool on its own engaged in, in, in some type of misconduct, let's say, you know, is that something that could be chargeable? And, and could you ascribe it intent to the engineer or who's responsible? Or, or is the entity reckless by not having enough guardrails around the technology? So these are, these are the challenges that I don't know we have clear answers to now, but ones that legislators are, are, are dealing with and ones that we're going to have to deal with um, as the technology evolves. But, but yeah, that's the issue. We'll do one last question. Apologize in advance, it's not a fun question. Um, a colleague of ours is going through kind of a difficult confirmation right now. Yeah. As I heard you speak, I just think it, I heard a lot of parallels and kind of the rhetoric from 2001 and the rhetoric we're hearing now. I don't think you need to speak on the specifics, but just I'm curious how you're sort of handling it or any words of advice of how to sort of I mean, you know, I don't know a deal personally. Um, it, it's it's a tough situation. I think it, it's the earlier question you asked about, you know, the politics, and, and we're just sort of casualties sometimes of the politics. Uh, and to, you know, have folks asking him if he celebrated or was happy uh, on 9-11, on it, it, it's beyond the pale. Uh, it really is beyond the pale, and it's troubling. Um, that he's just a proxy for, for other issues and, and these attacks are personalized and, and I know he has young children and um, I guess the, my hope is that the process works uh, as it should and it's about his, the merits of his nomination, uh, not the sideshow um, where they're trying to you know, hold him responsible for things that others may have said that he had nothing to do with and then you know, paint with a broad brush just because of his background, a broad hateful brush. It, it really is concerning. Thank you all for your questions. The last question I have for you today is there's a room here full of South Asian professionals, some just starting out, some more senior in their careers. What parting advice, inspiration, wisdom do you have for us? I, I think I've, I've touched on it a lot already is, you know, guard your reputations and do the work. Thank you. Can you give a round of applause? I just want to say thank you, Gravier, again, for taking the time to share your story and giving us the opportunity to share in your wisdom. It means a lot uh, that you took the time to be here today. My, my pleasure. And somebody promised me they would save a chicken tikka masala thing for me because I, I was so afraid to we eat have, it. We have a whole plate yeah. saved for you. I was so afraid to eat it earlier, but uh, thank you for having me. I mean, this has been great, and thank you for doing what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you again to the entire uh, Morrison Forrester team, Haima, uh, Katie, Lee, Rory, uh, Stacy. Everyone's been so incredible. To the Sabani team, Ashish, Hannah, who couldn't be here today, we're so appreciative of all your efforts. Um, and to all of you for joining us here tonight, I hope that um, if any part of his story resonated with you, if just getting to meet people who look like you here tonight uh, felt like something special and different, you'll continue not only to engage with South Asian Trailblazers, but also the South Asian Bar Association. Thank you all, uh, and have a wonderful evening.